Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Medieval Beginnings, a new close reading series from the London Review of Books. I'm Irina Dumitrescu, a contributor to the LRB, and I'm joined, as always, by the historian Mary Wellesley, who also writes for the paper on medieval literature and other topics. Hello, Mary. Hello, Irina. In the last episode, we were in 8th century Northumbria, with the life story of a charismatic saint and his friendly animal companions. This episode takes a darker turn, as we climb inside a tiny cell to explore the Ancranevisa, a guidebook written in the early 13th century for three anchoresses. These women lived a life of extraordinary restriction, permanently enclosed in small cells to live a life of prayer and contemplation. The text is a striking literary artifact, a piece of learned and often beautiful writing, but one which reveals a Gothic chapter in European history. We will be reading Bella Millet's translation of this work, along with her edition of the Early Middle English. Mary, so far we've read lyric and epic poetry, letters, a saint's life. Tell us, what kind of a text are we looking at today? Well, it's kind of a, I suppose, a how-to guide. It's a sort of handbook, a spiritual handbook for anchoresses, and we should probably deal with what they are first of all. So an anchorite, uh, anchoress is the female form, is a person who permanently encloses themselves inside a cell to live a life of prayer and contemplation. It comes from the Greek anahoring, which means to, to withdraw or retreat. And this handbook was written for, originally was written for three sisters. We know that they're genetic sisters, not spiritual sisters, who all enclosed themselves at some point in the kind of early 13th century. And the author who is, we're not sure the author is anonymous, but perhaps a Dominican friar, wrote this kind of guidebook on how to live. And what's interesting about it is it's a combination of very, very practical advice about, you know, the prayers that you should say and the food that you should eat and that kind of thing. But also this very beautiful theological meditation on the enclosed life. So I could almost say it's it's a self-help book, but not for everyone. It's for a very elite group of people who have devoted themselves to a particularly stringent spiritual and physical life and who are under psychological pressure in that environment. Huge. I mean, when an anchorite was enclosed, they were enclosed for the rest of their lives. And we, we have accounts. I mean, there's one account of a woman um, in a place called Frodsham in Cheshire being enclosed for 50 years. So it's it's quite an extraordinary life to choose. And it was a choice. And therefore, the text is, is hugely concerned with, well, how you survive psychologically in this environment. Uh, and it's fascinating for that reason. Can you give us a sense right now as we're beginning what the what the experience is like of reading the Ankara Nawissa? What does the voice of this author sound like? Well, it's it's a very I mean the, the authorial voice is a very clear one. There's a kind of paternalistic, moralizing tone. But one of the things that's so extraordinary about it is this kind of ready mix of colloquialism, these images that are so readily comprehensible, you know, that the author will talk about, you know, the relationship between a mother and a child, um, the way a mother will comfort her, her crying child, perhaps, or how one treats dogs, pet dogs in the house or whatever, you know, these very sort of domestic, comprehensible images. But alongside this kind of rich scriptural illusion, it's very, it's it's full of learning, this text. I mean, the the, the author may have been trained in Paris, gone to the university there. And it's also, you know, rhetorically, a really beautifully structured text. Um, you know, as a literary artifact, it's it's something truly to be marveled at. And another thing to say about it is, it's written in this period in the, in the early 13th century in the West Midlands of England. And it's it's kind of drawing on this very long tradition of what we call alliterative literature. Uh, so, so it kind of mimics some of the, the kind of pattern and the cadence and the sound of, of old English. And it really, it kind of delights in the vernacular itself. You know, there's a lot of wonderful kind of sonic play with words. And this early Middle English that it's written in is, is a mixture of old English, but also a lot of kind of French words coming in and then some kind of local dialect words. And it makes for a really kind of sonorous experience uh, reading it, especially if you hear it read aloud. 
So it's really a text that works on multiple levels. It captures the intellect, and I think we do have to imagine the anchorses who received this as being quite intelligent and um, learned women in their own right for them to be able to manage it. But there's also a sensual aspect of the language and a kind of everyday homey hominess to it that, you know, there's there's still an appeal to the emotions, if you like, in the book. Yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, it's it's clearly written for these three sisters in the initial instance, but then there are quite a few manuscripts of it. And the later recensions of the manuscripts show that its audience expanded uh, initially to kind of 20 20 or more, as the text says, and caresses. And then probably it went on to have an even larger audience. It was translated into French and into Latin. Henry VIII actually owned a copy of it rather interestingly. So it it had this, this kind of quite extensive afterlife. And clearly, you know, its richness as a text meant that although in the initial instance it was written for these women living this very particular life, it was then considered a work of great learning and kind of theological truth later on. Wonderful. But, you know, when, if we stay with the original audience, how are we to picture this? You know, how how are we to imagine the life of a woman, and they did seem to have been mostly women, who chooses essentially to imprison herself for the, the rest of her, of her days? What does the space look like? Um, <laughs> what does her day look like? So, okay, let's perhaps let's start with um, the liturgy of the enclosure ritual. So if you wanted to become an anchorite, you had to apply to your local bishop and you had to prove that you were of sound character and that you had the means to support yourself because, of course, you were enclosed. So you had to be tended by a servant or servants for the rest of your life. So this means it's an upper class diversion, right? It's not something that a poor woman would tend to do. Yeah, most likely, um, it seems from the evidence that most of these women were drawn drawn from the kind of gentry classes. But we do have evidence that people gave money to anchorites. I mean, people from all levels of society gave money. Um, so you could perhaps be supported if you were from, you know, lesser social status. But nonetheless, it is more likely to be women who are kind of relatively financially comfortable. Um, and we know that the original three women to whom the text is addressed, clearly it says that they are all um, well-bred women who in the bloom of their youth chose this vocation. So having applied to your bishop and you've got your um, permission to become enclosed, we then have this extraordinary uh, ceremony, which is the, the enclosure ritual. And in many places, it is indistinguishable from a funeral service. It's this piece of kind of macabre high drama. And the service opens with the, the recludendus, so that there would be recluse lying prostrate uh, on the floor of the church. And then they have these two lighted tapers that they offer at the altar. And then they process with the choir and the congregation out into the cemetery and out most likely onto the sort of north side of the church where the cell would be built. And that's it's the north side is usually chosen because it's where there's the least direct, direct sunlight and the coldest wind. You know, it's the most unforgiving place to be. And they then process into the cell where they would find, according to some um, liturgical directions, a ready dug grave. And they climb inside the ready dug grave. And at this point, the liturgy basically looks like a, a funeral service. And they are then sensed and sprinkled with holy water. And at the point in the funeral service where it says ashes to ashes, dust to dust, they are then, the door of the cell is bolted. And that's it. They are then uh, spiritually and symbolically dead to the world for the rest of their lives. And so once inside this cell, it's helpful perhaps to imagine the kind of architecture of the cell a little bit. So most likely the cell had three windows, one which looked out onto the cemetery or the graveyard, through which they could perhaps receive visitors and dispense spiritual counsel, one which looked onto a servant's parlour through which they could receive food and servants could take away waste, and then, most importantly, this little tiny window called the squint, which looked onto the sanctuary of the church. And the Ankrenawissa directs that for most of their lives in this cell, the two larger windows, i.e. not the squint, should be covered with a thick black curtain. Mm. And so this squint, 
which looks onto the church becomes this kind of conduit of sensation. So through this little tiny opening, they can smell the smell of the incense from the church services and hear the sounds of the sung liturgy. And perhaps it might be their only source of illumination. And so it's a very... It's so strange to imagine the experience of living in this kind of darkened, tiny, tiny space. I mean, I went to one of these, one of the very few surviving um, anchor holds, as they're called, and it, it had two stories, but the actual footprint of it, there wasn't enough space to lie down. I mean, it was basically uh -huh. the size of a cupboard. And, I mean, it's a life, we have to imagine a life without, without laughter, without touch, a life of sensory deprivation, prayers, your daily life, you know, it begins around kind of three in the morning, you start saying your prayers. And then it's just a day of, of prayers, vigils, fasting, perhaps a little bit of eating, maybe a visit from the outside world, but probably not. It's, it's so, so hard for us to imagine what this life was like. Thanks for listening to this extract from Medieval Beginnings, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other Close Reading series, sign up to our Close Reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash Close Readings or click on the link in the description.